Hello, everyone. Welcome to Path to Win Single Payer Now. Thank you for joining the Green Party of Missouri, the Green Party of California, and our distinguished panel of healthcare experts and activists. If you have questions for our speakers, then please put them in the Q&A section. If your question is directed toward a specific speaker, then please state that in the question. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible. Nassim will also be dropping resources from our speakers in the chat. We'll have the chat open for you to communicate with each other and to make connections. We do need to work together in solidarity to take on the massive for-profit healthcare industry and win single payer. Save the date, August 9th, the Green Party Peace Action Committee will be hosting a program, Never Again, Remembering Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a webinar in remembrance of the bombing of Nagasaki, August 9th, 1945. Tonight's program is moderated by Dr. Jill Stein. Dr. Stein practiced internal medicine and served as an instructor at Harvard Medical School for over 25 years. She worked with Physicians for Social Responsibility to fight incinerators, coal plants, and other forms of environmental racism. She co-authored In Harm's Way, Toxic Threats to Child Development, an acclaimed report sounding the alarm on the impact of toxic exposures on learning and behavior. She's, a, she's been a single payer advocate since the narrowly defeated 1998 Massachusetts referendum. Subsequently, she's moved from clinical medicine to political medicine, running for office to challenge the mother of all illnesses, our sick political system. Welcome, Dr. Stein. Thank you so much, Lauren, and welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight for this very important forum to help us win single payer now. And I want to thank the sponsors, the Green Party of California, Green Party of Missouri, uh, and the many co-sponsoring organizations and uh, the organizers, including Lauren Fila and Nassim Nouri and Don Fitz, who put this amazing event together. And a big thank you, especially to all the activists and the advocates who are here tonight uh, in the Zoom call. You are truly the engine of this movement, and we can't thank you enough. So uh, we're really honored to have everybody here to share your experience, your campaigns that you're involved in now, and the strategies for how we can work together uh, and make this an unstoppable movement. So I'll just say a few general words and then turn it over to our, our experts that I'm very excited to hear from tonight. So I'll just acknowledge that we are facing uh, a continuing crisis of our health and also of our health care. And for those of us who've been involved in this struggle for decades, um, you know, it, it only feels uh, more imperative really with every day. The crisis continues to get worse and the needs uh, continue to intensify and the dysfunction of our healthcare system uh, continues to compound. And while we are trying to move forward on a Medicare for all type system, increasingly we're ending up with a Medicare for none type system with the incredible corporate uh, profiteering that has uh, progressed really across our whole healthcare system, but including in Medicare itself. So the cause is really urgent. And just to review briefly, we're calling for a system of uh, healthcare as a human right through a single payer improved Medicare for all system. And that means everybody in, nobody out, comprehensive care from head to toe, from cradle to grave that covers you entirely, including your eyeglasses, your hearing aids, your dental care, your mental health, your reproductive health, uh, acute and chronic care across the board, um, and which includes free choice of doctor and hospital, which we do not have today and gets more, more narrowed by the day really. Um, and to point out that Medicare for all saves a huge amount of money and basically cuts in half what we are now paying of approximately $13,000 per person uh, and would save us approximately $400 billion a year. It's just staggering. This doesn't cost us. This actually saves us money at the same time that it extends care to cover everyone and extends care to make it comprehensive uh, for everyone. And it does this basically by streamlining 
healthcare, cutting out the worst aspects of it, the red tape, the paper pushing, the predatory aspects, uh, eliminating the exorbitant CEO salaries and the corporate profiteering, uh, including uh, that it would um, implement also bulk purchasing uh, of pharmaceuticals. And it frees us up basically as individuals, as providers, as consumers, and as a system to actually deliver health instead of fighting with profiteering insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and I'll just finally say that, um, you know, this is a, uh, a transformation whose time has come. And we're really in a perfect storm right now because the problem has become so severe and so acute at the same time that we have a really well-formulated and well-tested solution. And thanks to the work of so many advocates for so many years, the public in America has really been quite educated now. And where it was you know, just barely 50% many years ago, now for the past many years, the uh, support for healthcare as a human right through a Medicare for all type system, a single payer type system is really running strong now and really has super majority support from the polls that I've seen at least. So it's really the time uh, for us to stand up and not take no for an answer and really build a strong movement. And my last comment is just that it's not only the greedy uh, uh, corporations that we need to hold accountable, it's very much our elected officials who are in the business of empowering those greedy corporations um, who throw billions upon billions of dollars into lobbying and campaign contributions. So it's really important to hold all their feet to the fire and for us to uh, move forward together as quickly as possible. Our lives depend on this. So with that, I am going to turn now to our program and uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And this is um, Dr. Claire Cohn. Each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll move to a segment where we can have questions in a bit. So be sure to write down any uh, questions that come to mind and you can certainly submit them at any time through the chat. So Dr. Claire Cohn is a child and adolescent psychiatrist who fights for single payer healthcare as a member of National Single Payer, uh, PNHP, Physicians for a National Health Program. Uh, the Western Pennsylvania Coalition for Single Payer, and the Medicare for All Committee for the DSA. She is a founding member of the Pittsburgh Green New Deal, and she is on the advisory board of the Pittsburgh Black Workers Center. She has been a community activist and an organizer in Pittsburgh since the 1980s. So thank you so much, Dr. Cohn, for joining us tonight. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are the richest country in the history of the world, and we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world, yet we have the worst health statistics of all the 30 richest countries in the world. The best example of this is the shameful fact of this shameful fact is the CDC report on maternal mortality rates for 2021. The maternal mortality rate for all US women was 32.9 per 100,000 live births. For white women, it was 26.6. For black women, it was 69.9 per 100,000 live births. For comparison, the maternal, maternal mortality rate in the Europe, countries in the European Union averages eight per 100,000 live births, with the Scandinavian countries ranging from two to four per 100,000 live births. Another example of our shameful statistics is life expectancy. The United States ranks 42nd in life expectancies among the countries in the world. Cuba has a higher life expectancy than the United States. And I could give many other statistics. What is wrong with our healthcare system that we are performing so poorly in keeping Americans alive and healthy and in curing them when they're sick and injured? The answer is simple. 
The purpose of our healthcare system is about making profit for health insurance companies, big hospital chains, pharmaceutical corporations, and increasingly private equity firms. As a result, every year about 68,000 Americans die from either lack of or inadequate health care coverage, and over 100 million Americans have significant medical debt. In other rich countries, the purpose of their health care system is to provide health and well-being for their citizens. No matter how you look at it, there is a fundamental contradiction between using health care dollars to provide the best health care for all citizens versus using health care dollars to make profit for CEOs and other greedy stakeholders in the health care industry. For example, insurance companies often deny payment for care not based on what is in the best interest of the patient, but rather what would be more profitable for them. While pharmaceutical companies, corporations often persuade doctors to use the most profitable medication regimen rather than the best suited medication regimen for a particular patient. This means an overemphasis on certain surgical procedures and medications instead of more preventive, holistic, and customized care. This means restrictive provider networks denying patients the choice to pick the providers they prefer. This means closing needed hospitals and treatment units such as pediatric ICUs because they aren't big money makers. This means pushing recuperating patients out of the hospital early while pretending that they and their families can provide them good care and monitoring at home. This means staffing shortages with overworked, underpaid, and overwhelmed nurses and frontline staff. This means causing people to incur financially ruinous debt by charging unnecessary co-pays and deductibles. The sole purpose of co-pays and deductibles is to discourage people from seeking care so that there is more of that insurance dollar available for profit making. Since I'm a child psychiatrist, I will give you a concrete example of how privatization deforms care in psychiatry. Patients with suicidal depression need hospitalization to keep them safe while they're being stabilized and treated to the point that their suicidality resolves. There are two equally effective means of treatment medication or treatment with intensive cognitive therapy. But patients are not given choice between these modalities only because only a very few Cadillac insurance plans will authorize co cognitive therapy. Patients are forced, even if they don't want to, to choose medication. But many patients do prefer medications. And even for those patients, it takes approximately two weeks from the start of antidepressants to see their full therapeutic effect, as well as to be clear on what side effects there may be. If the medication is titrated up too fast, it increases the chances of the patient experiencing side effects. But insurance companies lean on doctors to rapidly increase these medications, increasing the chances of treatment failure. Insurance companies often deny authorization of payment for more than a week of hospitalizations so that patients are often discharged before it is confirmed that the medication is actually working for them and that they're not having side effects. Also due to the stigma of psychiatric illness and being treated for such illness, patients and their parents often need intensive counseling and education to ensure compliance after discharge. In addition, and at least where I live, there's often a shortage of services, services causing a waiting list. But because of the pressure to get patients out of the hospital and quickly discharge. Counseling and education is often poorly done, if at all, and there's frequently a disruption of the seamless continuity of care, leading to poor patient compliance, treatment failure, and multiple rapid readmissions, and sometimes to death if the patient kills themselves. I could go on and on, but I think you get the point. We need healthcare systems in which all of our healthcare dollars are committed to providing the best health care for everyone, not a system in which the needs of patients have to compete with the greed of capitalists for our health care dollars. Worldwide experience has shown that the only such systems are single health care 
single payer systems and national healthcare systems. These, in these systems, there's no profit motive. Rather, the bottom line is to provide the best, most equitable care with resources that a given country has. In such systems, care can be free at the point of service since there's no need to discourage people from seeking care when they need it. Over 50 years of experience has taught us that it is a myth that people overuse the healthcare system when they don't have, quote, skin in the game. People don't seek healthcare for fun, they seek it because they need it. A major part of the reason healthcare is so much more expensive for Americans is that we are charged deductibles and co-pays, which are totally unnecessary and whose sole purpose is to discourage people from getting needed care. In order to increase the profit that interested parties can make off of those off of people's healthcare dollars. Indeed, over 50, over 50 years of experience has shown that in the 30 richest countries in the world, Americans are the people least likely to seek health care and most likely to delay health care when they need it to the detriment of their health. Americans also pay anywhere from three to 10 times as much for their medication as people in other countries do. Single payer systems have the power to really bargain down the prices of medications with pharmaceutical companies whose exorbitant un unaffordable prices are solely charged out of greed. In our current healthcare systems, we often have shortages of supplies and staffing, while needed facilities and treatment units that are not profitable are cloaked for investors are closed to the detriment of care. In single payer healthcare systems, the people can control where health facilities are needed and have control over healthcare resources, supplies, and staffing issues. These things are determined by need, not by greed. Finally, in single payer and national healthcare systems, there's no need for restrictive networks. This means people, including Black people and people of color and LGBTQI people, can see whatever providers they prefer and they feel comfortable with giving them more choice. As you can see, if people in the United States had a single payer healthcare system or a national healthcare system, with the kind of resources we have in this country, we would be able to provide the best healthcare in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn, for those very compelling comments from the perspective of an area where there's just absolutely critical and devastating uh, shortage of, of care and services, one of maybe the most vulnerable areas in our healthcare system. So thank you very much for your compelling thoughts. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Don Fitz, who is a professor, an author, an editor, and uh, a Green Party of Missouri activist and organizer who actually helped organize tonight, tonight's uh, forum. He's taught environmental psychology at Washington University and other colleges and universities in the St. Louis area. And he has served on the editorial board of Green Social Thought since 1990. And aside from his academic publications, his articles have appeared in Telesur, MR Zine, ZNet, Counterpunch, Z Magazine, Radical America, Workers' Democracy, La Estiba, Vo uh, Voz de los Puertos, Black Agenda Report, Truth Out, Grist, Counter Curtains, and many others. So go ahead, Don, take it away, and we're going to hear about um, a different form of healthcare system that really, really puts us to shame. Go ahead. Thank you, Don. Okay, I'm Don Fitz, and I would like to say what I've learned in the last few years about Cuba, the Cuban health system. The first slide I want to show you is really an astounding set of figures because it shows that during COVID, uh, the life expectancy of the United States went down by minus 2.9 years, while in Cuba, the life expectancy actually went up for a tenth of a year. I don't know of any other statistics in modern medicine that show a poor uh, country attacked by the United States for over 60 years actually outdoing it in terms of medical care. Uh, some of the things that Cuba did, which I think are uh, you know, extremely important to realize, one is when the revolution began, the revolutionaries did not consider just Medicare for all. 
They consider a revolution in poverty, a revolution to fight racism, a revolution for food, sanitation, literacy, and education. In other words, all of these were conceptualized as a change together. By 1964, Cuba had a single point of entry for every person to go to a clinic. And you think, compare that to the United States. How many points of entry do we have to the medical system? Is it hundreds or is it thousands? It's a totally confused system. By 1984, Cuba had a consultorio that everybody could walk to who lives in any urban area or ride a bicycle or a horse to if you lived in an urban area. This is what a consultorio looks like. It was an old house. Notice how it's not a rich palace. Uh, when I will go inside the consultorio, this is about 2009 or 2010. Uh, there were everywhere we had electronic things in the United States to uh, educate people. Notice how this is what I did when I was in elementary school uh, and the same sort of thing here. Um, so and this is a, a little more recent. This is Salvador Allende Hospital, the best one that is that is in Havana. You notice that the air conditioning system consists of opening the doors. Uh, opening the window with no screen. The television system, well, if you can bring a television system from home, you might be able to plug it in. But there's not a television with 500 channels uh, guaranteed to everyone. What you, what you basically have is the essence of healthcare for everyone and luxury in healthcare uh, for a very, very few. So let's fast forward this for a few decades uh, from the revolution. Okay, so COVID hits in 2019, 2020. What happened is that Cuba had, had an integrated system where the national health system would define what everybody does. These are three medical students who were going to assigned areas in Havana for the purpose of um, the, the purpose of checking on every citizen in Havana, and this was happening all over Cuba. And if somebody was elderly or had a, a health problem or couldn't go to the store, it was the responsibility of the medical students to work with the other systems in, 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 uh, in Cuba to do that. Now, how did do Cuba accomplish something like a system like this? It was not because spending a lot of money. The average cost for healthcare in Cuba is one tenth, is one -tenth of what the uh, cost per person per year in the United States. Cuba has been doing this for a long time. This is another set of amazing statistics. If you've heard about the, the um, special period when the Soviet Union fell in 1990 and, and the U.S. put heavy sanctions on Cuba, you might not have noticed what happened to infant mortality. At the beginning of the special year, Cuba had a higher infant mortality than the U.S. At the end of the special period, Cuba had a lower infant mortality than the U.S. This is because all, despite the fact that men were losing 20 pounds per person, the resources of Cuba went to maternal health care and went to infant health care. So it has a lot of experience dealing with crises. Cuba also deals with things internationally. Uh, this is a woman who was in medical school uh, when the earthquake hit in, in Haiti, and she dropped out of medical school to go to Haiti and to, to serve the people there. And, and one of the things that people observed in Haiti was when, when the Cubans went to Haiti, they were there before the American doctors were there, and they were there after the American doctors left. While American doctors would fly out at night via a helicopter to a luxury hotel, the Cuban doctors would live in the same conditions that the, the Haitians did. They would see the same horror sights that the Haitians did. They would smell the same smell of death that the Haitians did. Here's a little more modest situation in Peru where I went oh, uh, 10 or 11 years ago. You notice this is another consultorio, another doctor's office. Notice how modest it is. Uh, th 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 this is a medical student I knew who, who was a Cuban medical student. They had a celebration. So he was giving, uh, they were giving free health care uh, to uh, people could bring their children in. This is the sort of thing that Cuban, Cuba has done and uh, in dozens of countries around the world that has served millions and millions of people. In the United States, if you would, looked at TV in St. Louis, you would reach the conclusion that the biggest health crisis um, is erectile dysfunction. But if you look at Cuba, what, what they pride themselves in doing is tropical diseases. Uh, Cuba, and much of this work is done at the Pedro um, Curie Institute of Medicine, which I was able to visit when I was in Cuba. They, uh, they deal with, with things like tuberculosis and malaria, which are the major killers. Uh, in, the, in the poor world, especially the tropical world, they've developed four vaccines for polio, type B meningitis, measles, mumps, and rubella. 
So uh, this has been critical. Okay, then we go forward to the, uh, to, back to COVID again. Amazing fact is that during the height of COVID, Cuba, a poor country under sanctions from the U.S., was actually able to sit, send help to a rich country in, in, uh, in Italy when it could not provide for itself. Another, there's a lot of things that happened then, but another one which is very noteworthy was that the, um, the, the ship, the, the cruise ship Braemar was, uh, uh, had 50 people on board who had COVID symptoms. And uh, the, nobody would let it uh, dock in, even the Bahamas and Barbados, even though they're both co British Commonwealth countries would not let it uh, dock, but Cuban, uh, uh, Cuba would let it dock because they were confident that th the doctors could take care of the thousand people on board. And the sign says to Quiero Cuba, which means I love you Cu Cuba. So what has been the attack, the effect, what has been efforts of the United States? The United States has done everything it could to destroy, to attack and to destroy the Cuban healthcare system. Uh, uh, Trump was particularly vicious, um, adding new sanctions to the sanctions already in existence to Cuba, which included many medical efforts. And what, what did uh, Biden do? He proved that he could be more vicious than Trump, adding new sanctions. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a, a, a darling of much of the Democratic Party left, was able to talk out of both sides of her mouth. Uh, condemning um, Cuba, she uh, proposed sanctions. What has happened in Cuba nonstop and has not, um, has not gone down is that the Cuban medical professional parole. Okay, what that means is that a Cuban who is a physician and wants to desert to America, America actively recruits Cubans to leave their post, you know, to desert to America and make massive amounts of money. I mean, Cubans, when, when I left, we're making like forty dollars a week. You know, they have medical, all sorts of expenses paid, but but the, the amount they would get in the United States would be vastly more. So uh, it, it, this did work for one point two five percent of Cubans. You know that that's uh, ninety eight point seven five percent did not do that, even though they ha had huge amounts. Uh, they would have made fabulously more money, but that left five hundred uh, medical workers absent in countries, through, uh, poor countries throughout the world and millions and millions of poor people across the world have defended on, uh, depended on Cuban uh, medicine. Uh, now, I would conclude several things from this. I, I think the most important thing is that I don't think any of us tonight see Medicare for all as the end point. I think all of us see, us, see it as a beginning point and we must never forget that because like, what, like I said, at the beginning of the Cuban revolution, what happened was that there was a focus on all sorts of those social Ill, ills that were left over from the Batista regime, and they focused on all of those ills at once. And of course, those of us who are working in Medicare for All, I think most of us are working on a whole lot of, uh, of other issues. And so it, it's important to emphasize that the United States is not just undermining medical care. I mean, it's not being stagnant on medical care. They want the United States is trying to undermine and destroy medical care. At the same time, it's wanting to destroy public housing. It's wanting to destroy social security. It's wanting to get rid of public education. It wants to destroy labor rights and destroy abortion rights. And what, that's what we see inside the United States. What we see outside of the United States is not just United States undermining Cuba, but, under, but United States providing a model for other rich countries to go back on the things that they've done. And, and to reduce their health care and to not provide extent, uh, not to extend health care in poor regions of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So when, when, we, when I think of what uh, Medicare for all is, I think of it as a spark, as a spark that can ignite a revolution for health care and for all other human rights. A spark, a sp that, that's my uh, timer telling me to shut up, okay? <laughs> but, but a spark that can ignite struggles throughout the world. And I do want to finish up saying this. Uh, this is my book on Cuban healthcare. And you saw that uh, photo of the girl at the bottom. I think that's the best photo I ever took because he here she is. She's, uh, this is probably the first time she's seen a doctor. And, and she's very, very skeptical of, of whether going to a doctor is a great idea or not. Th thank y'all very much. Thank you so much, Don. Um, and all those points I think are really well made. We get very focused on on uh, Medicare for all and very focused on, you know, how we play this game, but it's really important not to lose sight of the fact that it's 
Yeah. It's really only a beginning. And also that we can't fight this battle just fighting for healthcare. I mean, because our health is the product of so many, you know, social, economic, racial disparities, injustice, and so on. You know, health is inherently kind of a, fi a final common denominator where everything has impact, but also just in terms of fighting the fight. If we allow ourselves to be divided off to just fight for, you know, for healthcare, then we'll never build the critical mass that we need because it really requires an all out you know, war with uh, the rapacious oligarchy, you know, in order in order to make progress, because we're not making progress, actually, we're being beaten back on really all fronts. And, and it's very critical that we think in terms of large coalitions. And that's one of the exciting things about this forum tonight is that it, it really brings people together, not just from healthcare, but also um, from labor and unions and the peace community and, and all that. So all those points are very well made, Don. Thank you very much. And now we're going to turn to our third speaker, um, Ryan Skolnick. Ryan is a community organizer for the California Nurses Association and for National Nurses Organizing Committee, which is the largest union of registered nurses in the United States. He first started organizing for single payer in 2017, where he helped educate the public about SB 562, the 2017 California single payer bill by speaking at events and writing articles and recording educational videos. He currently works on the campaign to pass CalCare, the most recent attempt to implement a single payer program in California. So thank you so much, Ryan, for being here tonight and take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Jill and Dr. Stein, and thank you all for so much for having me. I have the privilege and honor to pitch single payer healthcare at the state level to a, a crowd that I know has questions about it, and I'm going to do my best to answer them. So I'm going to start with a key premise, which is that it is our belief that the ultimate destination of state single payer is federal Medicare for all. The, the campaigns that we are running, specifically here in California to pass CalCare, but throughout, no one is under the impression that that's the destination. Just like, we've, you've, just like we've heard that Medicare for all is the start of federal reform, we view this as a way to help with that. And I'm going to explain how. But first, I want to give a little bit of a lay of the land as I've seen it in my organizing here in California for CalCare in terms of the single payer movement. And I want to start with a few and a few observations about single payer supporters themselves. First being that single payer supporters are unique in that I've seldom seen an issue with advocates who are as policy intelligent as single payer supporters. And that makes sense. We've had to be. It, it's very hard to argue at face value that not that everyone doesn't deserve health care, at least not in a way that the average person won't be turned off by. So the opposition. Democrats, Republicans, the insurance and drug companies that control them is always rooted in wonky arguments that the average person should not be expected to have answers to because they're not scholars in this issue. So single payer supporters by necessity have become extremely adept at understanding the policy merits of the policy, not just the moral ones. Second, single payer supporters are some of the most fiercely dedicated and fiercely motivated activists of any issue, which also makes sense. The right to life precedes all other rights. You cannot exercise any sort of human right if you are not alive. And healthcare is the policy embodiment of the right to life, which it means, of course, it's going to be a major motivator, especially because so many people, if you, have, if you yourself have not been the victim of our for-profit greed-based health insurance system, then you know someone who has everyone in the country without exception. So single payer supporters are extremely educated and extremely motivated. They're also on the right side of history and we know that. The more that we know because we've seen decades and decades of data that the more collective a healthcare system is, the better it performs. Even the international hybrid alternatives like the German healthcare system don't perform as well as single payer based financing healthcare systems and obviously um, socialized systems as well. So we have empirical examples. We're not proposing something that hasn't been seen. 
It's a matter of making sure people know that. And we're not breaking ground here in terms of health policy. What we're advocating for is common sense. What we have now is the aberration. I wanted to set that groundwork really quickly because this is the central premise of a lot of these state organizing efforts, which is that people are on board intrinsically with the goal of Medicare for all. It's a matter of finding them where they are and bringing them into the movement. And our vehicle for doing that, for building the sort of movement that it'll take to win, because we know that solely hoping that we elect the right people is not the recipe for success of this issue or any issue. Our vehicle is CalCare, which is the California Guaranteed Healthcare for All Act. We call it that because it would implement the most robust system of state-based guaranteed healthcare for all that this country has seen. And it would implement what we call single payer on the front end. I'll get into some of the policy challenges of state single payer towards the end of my time, time permitting, and I'm sure they'll come up in questions. But from the perspective of the end user under CalCare, it's gonna be a single payer system. There aren't multiple insurance companies or anything like that. You have one entity that pays for your care. So that's what CalCare would do. And there are a few policy and political benefits to this approach keeping in mind the sort of activist that a single payer supporter is. First, you have the obvious ones, which are we guarantee healthcare for all at a lower systemic cost free at the point of service. The central tenant of guaranteed healthcare for all is that cost is never a barrier and that there's that greed never gets between people and their doctor. That is achieved under CalCare, which is of course what we're trying to achieve by implementing single payer nationally. But another policy benefit, this is, Definitely, this is true everywhere, but this is hyper true in California, is reversing the creeping trend of provider side middlemen in addition to, to payer side middlemen. California is a state that more than any other has really latched on to this trend of provider based middlemen and the value based payment models that come with them that we view as antithetical to guaranteeing healthcare as a right because they pit providers against patients. When you tell doctors that you stand to make more money by spending less on care, you are creating a direct incentive on the provider side, not just the payer side to save money, but the provider side to deny care even when it's necessary. The California healthcare system has embraced this model wholeheartedly. Our Medicaid system is becoming more and more entrenched and dominated by these alternate payment models that do pit doctors against patients. And we view healthcare as a, a way to reverse that in the shorter term, because CalCare doesn't allow for that sort of intermediary. It's a direct contract between the provider and the system. You don't have provider or payer side middlemen to the greatest extent possible under law. So that's another po political or uh, politics, or sorry, policy benefit of implementing a system like that is it can accomplish this quicker. But in terms of politics, I want to address one very fundamental thing, because whenever we hear people talk about state-based single payer, we hear about how we can set the template for the rest of the nation. And I don't know, I mean, we definitely can set a model for how it can be done, but obviously not every state can implement the same type of system California can. However, I think the number one most beneficial political gain to state-based campaign is reaching and cultivating a whole new class of activists that solely federal efforts would never be able to reach. And I've seen this as someone who's organized for both. There's a lot of pessimism and apathy towards federal action, and rightly so. You have people who understand how corporate dominated our politics are, but then you have people who aren't as corporate, who aren't as plugged into the damage that that is. And you have people in blue states who are not super receptive to organizing for something that at the federal level, they see a Republican run house and it's like, oh, Democrats are on our side, but Republicans aren't. But when you have a democratic dominated legislature and governorship like we do, then they're like, oh, we can win this. We, it's a lot easier to motivate those groups of people because the thing is when you have people who understand how corporate dominated our healthcare system is, it's very easy to plug them in because they're already likely strong supporters of the issue. This is reaching a whole separate group of people and the movement to win guaranteed healthcare for all can't be exclusive. It needs to reach as many people as possible because that's how we win. We build a mass grassroots movement and we've reached so many thousands and thousands of activists throughout our state single payer organizing that are now also organizing with us on the federal level and they wouldn't have 
found the federal campaign absent their work on health care. We're proud that we are contributing to both. NNU, CNA, the nurses unions, we have been at the forefront of state-based single payer in California since the early 90s, but we've also been advocating for federal Medicare for all since our inception as a staff nurse-led union also, because we understand that healthcare justice everywhere is what needs to happen, not just in one place. And we view these as a direct complement. We view state single payer as a way to help fix California's healthcare system now. California, obviously, there are other efforts going nationwide as well, but also creating a whole new class of activists that are also plugged into the federal work. And we're proud of that work. And we believe that reaching people where they are in as many venues as possible is how we build a movement strong enough. So before I wrap up my time, I because I know there are questions that are gonna pop up about implementing state single payer, I wanna address three of them um, and then I'll wrap it up. So first I wanna talk about the obvious one that you hear from politicians everywhere, which is, which is how do you pay for it? How do you pay for it? Well, when it comes to federal, that's easy. You don't pay for things on the federal level in that same way. So that's easy. State, it's a little different because states don't issue currency, right? But me, the rub here, though, is that states don't pay for their entire healthcare systems out Ryan, of their own. Ryan, hit one more minute. Sure thing. So um, I guess so. I guess we can just answer these during questions because I'm sure they'll come up. So I'll wrap up by saying this, and also I'll put our email in the chat so you can email if these if we don't get to these as well. But I will say this: we believe that at the end of the day, justice, in injustice everywhere means there anywhere in this country means there's still more work to do, and that absolutely applies to healthcare, which again, as I mentioned earlier, is, addresses the fundamental right of human life. We believe that state single payer will implement a system that guarantees health care to all here, and it can be done quicker. It's still a challenge. We believe it can be done, but we also believe that effort will also benefit the federal campaign. We're excited to continue the work. I'm going to continue, like I said, I'm going to put my email or the email for our campaign in the chat right now. And if anyone is interested in asking any questions that don't come up in the Q&A session, then we can answer them there. Otherwise, thank you so much for having me and onward to guaranteed healthcare for all everywhere. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Really appreciate hearing your decades worth of experience. Thank you so much for sharing. And we're going to turn now to our fourth uh, speaker, and that is Dr. Margaret Flowers. Margaret is a pediatrician, a public health advocate, and an activist who started campaigning full-time for single payer um, in 2007. And she has served as board advisor for Physicians for National Health Program, as co-chair of the Green Party of the United States, as an organizer with Occupy Washington Movement, and uh, is the co-director of Popular Resistance, which everybody should be sure to check out if you aren't already subscribed. And she co-founded the Maryland Healthcare uh, is a Human Right Campaign, the Health Over Profit for Everyone, also known as HOPE Campaign, and the uh, wonderful podcast, Clearing the Fog. Go ahead, Margaret. Thanks for being here. Great. Thank you so much, Jill. And thank you to... Uh, Lauren and Nassim and Don for organizing this, uh, to Claire Cohen for your excellent explanation of why we need National Improved Medicare for All, and to Don for uh, talking about the great example of Cuba and what a country that has, you know, is much poorer than the United States is able to accomplish. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for talking about uh, the efforts there in California. So um, I'm supposed to talk about National Improved Medicare for All and um, and how we're going to get there, which I think is you know what everybody wants to know. Um, so why do we need a national healthcare system? We've, as everybody, you know, there's so many experienced people on this webinar uh, as uh, participants, uh, single payer activists. I'm sure that many of you know this already, but I'll say it. You know, we can't fix the healthcare crisis in the United States until we take healthcare out of the market based system. That is fundamentally the root problem with our healthcare system is that it's a for profit entity. And so the profits come before people's lives, 
their well-being. So we've got to stop that. And that's got to be through a national system of some universal system of some sort. We are fighting for healthcare as a public good, for healthcare as a human right. And what it, we mean by human right is that it's universal, that everybody's in the same system. And that way, it just automatically raises the level of quality of that system because rich and poor, we're all in it. And so even those you know, with a stronger political voice than, than the people who are oppressed by the system um, are gonna be fighting to make sure that that's a good system. So when everybody's in it together, it's a, it's a stronger system. It needs to be equitable. Human rights principle of equity means that people get what they need uh, based on their own abilities. Also that it's transparent and accountable and that we have a right to participate in that system, to have some say over how that system operates. So uh, when I, uh, when Howie Hawkins was running uh, on the Green Party ticket for president, I helped to write his healthcare platform. You can see that if you go to his website, it's still up there at howiehawkins.us, if you go to is issues and then policy papers. And what we advocated for was an immediate uh, change to a national improved Medicare for all. And then from there, over a period of time, developing that system into a national health service. So we actually create a fully public system that has a democratic, uh, that it's democratically run. So communities have a say over what health services are provided in their communities. So how do we talk about national improved Medicare for all? Uh, just a few points on that. Oh, you know, and I forgot to hit my timer, but I'm, no, I'm sure you'll let me know uh, how I'm doing. But uh, so national, every single person residing in the United States is included in the system. Every single person living in the United States is included. We're not going to say if somebody gets hit by a car or has an accident, we're not going to ask them what their citizenship status is. When you present to the hospital, care comes first, and then we can sort out if you haven't been registered into the system, that, that can come later, but every single person is in it. Um, national, because wherever we travel, we can get care. So when we're on vacation, we can still get care. If we need to move, we don't have to worry. If you have a particular condition that requires a specialist who's outside your state, you can go and see that specialist. So this is very important. Um, a national system, as I think uh, someone alluded to, it might've been Joe, gives us monopsony power. We have the ability with a national system to set the prices, to negotiate for fair prices for goods and services, for pharmaceuticals, something that we don't have in this country. There's no rational basis at this moment uh, for the pricing of our healthcare, which is the most expensive in the world. It's simply based on what companies can get away with. Um, there's tremendous savings in a national improved Medicare for all or healthcare uh, service in that the administrative complexity goes way down. I've seen estimates even of six or $700 billion a year that we can save on administrative costs if we go to a single payer system. It's one system, one set of rules, makes it very streamlined and very uh, simple. And then very important is that we can give uh, global budgets to hospitals and health facilities. And this is important because as we know, many of our hospitals, particularly rural, rural hospitals or ones that are in underserved urban communities are being closed down because they can't, sometimes it's just uh, venture capitalists that come in and take them over and run them into the ground. Uh, sometimes it's because they can make more money by selling the hospital for luxury condominiums. Um, so by giving the hospitals a global operating budget, they can focus on serving their communities and not have to worry about whether they're making making money or not. Um, we talk about improved Medicare for all because we have to recognize that our current Medicare is not comprehensive. It doesn't cover everything. And so we're talking about a healthcare system where all necessary care is included, uh, including long-term care, uh, at-home care, substance abuse, mental health, eyes, ears, you know, teeth, all of that needs to be included. We have to stop thinking that we can separate the body out. You know, I call it body part. 
you know, it's like, well, we'll cover this part of your body, but we won't cover that part of your body. It makes no sense. And the decisions need to be made by health professionals and the patients, not by some administrator uh, with no knowledge at all. I know um, if there was uh, one doctor advocate here in Maryland that used to ask the, the administrators when they would deny care uh, for their medical license and say, hey, you're practicing medicine right now. Where's your medical license when you're denying this care? Very important, as we heard about the co-pays, that there are no upfront out-of-pocket costs so that people don't make a financial decision when they're seeking health care. And then finally, just we can go to Medicare for all very easily and include everyone, as I saw in the chat, womb to tomb, uh, because uh, basically we have already the infrastructure through our Medicare, current Medicare system, we have a national infrastructure for billing for medical services. Every health professional in the United States has a provider identification number. And so it'd be very easy to make that transition, but it will take time to move over to a fully public system. So why national versus state? Uh, and I'll run through this fairly quickly. One is uh, something called the Southern Strategy. It was employed when Medicare and Medicaid were passed in 1965. And actually it was even done before that for other issues. But basically it was the idea that uh, you know, racism, which is still very prevalent in the United States, but certainly was part of the fight back in, in the 1960s. Uh, people didn't want a system that everybody in the country could have access to. And they knew that if you put it out to the states, like our Medicaid system was carved out and, and put out to the states because some states are going to provide, you know, a greater amount of care to the Medicaid recipients, and some will be discriminatory. And so we don't want that in our in our system. We want every person in every state to have access to the same health care care system. Um, state plans. I'm sorry, but I you know I, I've authored state plans. I was a you know an, an advocate of that early on until my thinking really changed through my experiences. Um, I'm talking about you know like 2004, 2005 uh, time. We uh, we can't we have to be honest that state plans can't really be a single payer plan because there are too many different federal parts of the system through Medicare, through the federal employee health benefits, Tricare, the VA system, and we can't regulate employer based uh, health care. We've through the ERISA law, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Uh, court cases in recent years, in the past couple of decades, have all really leaned towards favoring the rights of employers. And so even like in Vermont, where they tried to get access to healthcare data from these employee plans, they were not successful in doing that. They lost that ERISA case. So, um, so we can't actually do a, a pure single payer system at the state level. Uh, we would have to change federal laws. And if we're gonna start changing federal laws, let's all focus on changing the federal law to be a system for everyone in the country. Also, if we start doing a state by state effort and getting waivers to take the Medicare dollars to use for that state systems, so we're going to start dismantling our Medicare system. And that's our one of our most important systems. You have one more minute. One more minute. Okay. Uh, state budgets are finite. Uh, so uh, as we heard, federal budgets are not finite. So it'd be very difficult for states. They'll be under pressure to cut people, cut services. Um, we win national by fighting for national. There's no a uh, logical path that we can say that if one state wins single payer, it's going to go national. Uh, if if a state wins what they call single payer and then it fails for the reasons I mentioned, that will actually hurt the movement. And we don't want to lose those activists. States like California, New York, progressive states, we need them in the fight uh, to focus on national. How we win? Creating a movement of movements. So connecting this to everything, bringing groups in. Uh, we've done this before in other campaigns. Uh, and supporting their struggles and recognizing that we're seeing a lot more physicians and nurses going on strike. The, their struggles are part of our you know, failing healthcare system and we need to be there showing solidarity, educating them about why this things could be, you know, why the things are the way they are, how they could be different and bringing them into the movement. Uh, it's basic education, organizing and mobilizing, putting pressure on our lawmakers, which includes running against them, uh, picketing private insurers, uh, picketing when hospitals are shut down or they're shutting down their programs, understanding the obstacles, which I can get into uh, later, what we can expect from our opponents. And then finally, just the, the 
the acronym I use is ICU. We need to be independent when we're fighting for this, independent of political party, not tying our agenda uh, to the, you know, like a Democrat or Republican, but making sure that we're fighting for this issue. And as long as that party's in online with us, cool, but uh, we need to, we're not going to tie our agenda to a particular party's agenda. We have to be clear about what we're fighting for because they'll really try to confuse us. And then we need to be uncompromising. They're always going to tell us we're asking for too much. We have to recognize that we're asking for what we need and that's never too much. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, very uh, powerful arguments there in a debate that I'm sure will go on for a while, but um, Thank you so much for giving us the uh, the big view the big view from the national perspective and very compelling arguments that you make there. Um, we are going to turn now to a word from students from a national health program, and we're going to ask Donald Donald Bourne to comment on a recent resolution from students for a national health program. And this calls for the American Medical Association to drop their opposition to single payer. And that would be a great thing. So take it away, uh, Donald. Yeah, so earlier this year, at the beginning of June, we passed a resolution through the medical student section um, calling on the AMA to take a neutral stance towards single payer. Uh, this is very similar to the resolution um, that went up for a vote within the AMA in 2019 and was narrowly defeated with 47% of the vote. So this is going to come up in the AMA for a vote in June of 2024. So through this next year um, is a group we're going to advocate um, for as many state and specialty medical societies within the AMA um, to support this resolution. Um, so be on the lookout for that next year. Awesome. Thank you so much and uh, terrific work. And um, uh, we're all for it and um, keep us posted. Thank you. Um, now we are going to hear brief comments from some of the many co-sponsors. I think there are like 30 organizations that are co-sponsoring tonight. And uh, after these brief, like two minute comments from uh, each of four people that will be on a panel and we'll have a couple of those panels. Um, when we get through each panel, we'll then have uh, a couple of questions. So definitely put them in the chat if you haven't already. So um, I guess I'll introduce people here uh, one at a time. So this is in our first group of commenters. Uh, we're going to hear first from Matsumila Odom. If I've pronounced that incorrectly, please um, uh, please instruct me when you come on. Uh, and Matsumila is from the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. And we've all heard a lot about the Uhuru Movement and their, the battle that they are fighting against really vicious uh, targeting and political oppression right now, basically for expressing their political beliefs. Um, very scary what's happening to them, kind of a, the new McCarthyism in front of our eyes right now. So uh, Matsumela, do we have you on I think camera? we're still um, pulling Matsumela. We've requested you come back as a panelist, Matsumela, if you can accept that. Um, and if we can go ahead and go to Len and we'll come back to Matsumela, please. Okay. All right. Great. So we're going to hear from Len Demmer from the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Go ahead, Len. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank the Green Party for hosting this event. Um, my name is Len Demmer, and I am the chair of the local branch of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement here in St. Louis, Missouri. And mm -hmm. I'm also our national membership chair. Um, Uhuru Solidarity Movement is the organization of white people formed by and led by the African People's Socialist Party and Chairman Omali Eshetela with the assignment of going back into our own white communities to win other white people to stand um, in solidarity with the African with African liberation and the demand for reparations for centuries of stolen African lives, land, labor, and resources. And we really appreciate the opportunity to co-sponsor this event because the question of healthcare is so important. And we understand from our leadership in the African People's Socialist Party that the struggle for universal healthcare is ultimately part and parcel 
of the struggle for socialism. And under this current colonial capitalist system built on the enslavement of African people and genocide and land theft from the indigenous people, healthcare, like everything else, exists to make a profit for the colonial ruling class. And as white people who believe in socialism, it's important that we internalize what Chairman Amali Eshetela means when he says that the only way to overturn capitalism is to overturn colonialism, the colonial mode of production upon which all capitalist activity rests and which has brought wealth and resources to the white world on the backs of African, indigenous, and colonized peoples. And when African people are free and self-determining, only then can there be true socialism in which healthcare will be respected as a human right to which all have equal access. And organizing for reparations to African people is key work that we as white people must do to oppose a blood-soaked profit-driven system that denies healthcare to African and oppressed people. And this is yet another aspect of the colonial conditions imposed on African people in this country, along with police murder, police terror, mass incarceration, gentrification, and infant and, more, and maternal uh, mortality. And um, again, I just want to thank you to the Green Party for your support um, of the Hands Off Uhuru campaign and the demand for the U.S. government to drop the charges against Chairman Amali Eshetela and the Uhuru Three, and to all of those who want updates and more information on how to support this important campaign, please go to handsoffuhuru.org. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and thank you for filling everybody in on this fight for, um, well, against police terror and security straight terror and the new McCarthyism and political repression because you can't wait until it's coming for you because if you wait till it's coming for you, it is too late. So thank you so much. You're fighting for us all. Thank you for your struggle. Thank you, Dr. Um, sure thing. And next I'm gonna call on Aza Rojbi and please again, fill us in if I've, if I've uh, pronounced your name wrong. And uh, Aza is from the Friends of Cuba against the U.S. blockade, uh, and you are in Vancouver, if I'm right. So go ahead, take it away. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Dr. Jill. Uh, yeah, I'm in Vancouver, Canada, so this is a solidarity from across the border. Uh, from Canada, I see some things in the chat about Canada. Um, I would like to quickly add on that that you know, sure, it might sound better when you're looking from the United States to Canada, but I can tell you that living here, uh, our healthcare system is also lacking in funding. Uh, we have wait lists of years of people to even access cancer treatment. Uh, imagine somebody waiting years for cancer treatment. So healthcare system in Canada, unfortunately, is, um, is basically deteriorating in terms of access and in terms of funding. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to, um, as, as somebody coming from Canada, thank the Green Party of California and the Missouri Green Party for putting together a very educational webinar and uh, inviting us to participate today. Uh, I think we can all agree that healthcare is a human right. Uh, and I wanted to thank Don for really highlighting uh, how Cuba puts this uh, slogan into action uh, by putting people first uh, and having a healthcare system that puts humans before profit. Uh, it's something that we can learn from both in the United States and in Canada. Um, I visited Cuba several times. I had the opportunity to visit hospitals, uh, local healthcare clinics, polyclinics. Um, and I saw for myself, as, as Don highlighted, how the healthcare system in Cuba has achieved so much under over 60 years of a blockade. Um, I also saw firsthand uh, the shortages that are created by this blockade by the United States against a country like Cuba, uh, whether that is in medicine and medical equipment, um, especially now after the COVID-19 pandemic and the worldwide shortages in a lot of medicine, it's even harder for a country like Cuba to access all of that. Um, as a quick example, in 2022, Cuba was not a, able to purchase insulin uh, for their local population from a Danish company just because the bank, uh, Danske Bank, has refused to do transfers with Cuba. And, and adding to this, uh, actually, the United States government added Cuba to a so-called list of state sponsors of terrorism, uh, which makes it even harder for Cuba to do regular trade uh, in order to get any sort of financing internationally. I will uh, post a little bit in the chat uh, some information about a campaign that was launched 
by groups in the United States, Canada, and internationally. And, and I'm sorry, but your time is up. So could you finish your talk? Uh, of course. Yeah, I will, I will post that. I've got a postcard here. I'll invite all of you to sign it. It's to Joe Biden uh, asking for Cuba to be taken off the list of states a sponsor of terrorism. So I'll post more on the chat. And uh, yeah, let's continue fighting across the border for a free, accessible, universal healthcare for all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, continue to join forces on behalf of uh, relieving Cuba of this terrorist blockade, basically, that has been exercised against it for decades. Uh, so definitely solidarity across the borders on many fronts. Thank you, Aza. And uh, Steve Zelter now from the Labor Education Project on the AFL-CIO International Operations. Thank you so much, Steve, for speaking with us tonight. Thanks for having us. And uh, <clears throat> we're Labor Education Project and AFL Seattle International Operations actually is organizing to oppose uh, U.S. Uh, destroying healthcare systems like in Chile. And this is the 50th anniversary of the Chilean coup. And that's one of the things they privatized when there was a coup supported by the United States and the AFL Seattle leadership. And we believe that this fight for healthcare means a fight against the AFL Seattle leadership and the union leadership who support privatization of healthcare. In fact, they're, sell, they're supporting privatization Medicare Advantage programs. So we have to have a political struggle in the labor movement and the unions against the union bureaucracy. In New York, there's a big scandal because the union leadership, public worker union leadership actually voted uh, to, to destroy the public uh, health care system and, and force people into uh, a private system and destroy Medicare. So I think that it's important that we organize around the education in the working class and the unions Mm -hmm. against a pro-capitalist ideology. And also we're gonna be bringing some a woman journalist who's gonna be in St. Louis on the uh, 9th on Sunday and the Green Party is co-sponsoring it. We're having a trade unit come from uh, Chile and it's gonna be in San Francisco on the 15th, a public health care trade unit. Because as I said earlier, uh, this is an international fight against privatization. And as the sister said from Canada, the United States is pushing to privatize national mm -hmm. healthcare systems in Britain uh, Canada and around the world. So it requires a political change in our unions and our working class. When workers go on strike, like the writers and others, they lose their health care. And the bosses use that to force workers back to work. So we have to politically educate workers that their unions, like the SAIU, instead of supporting private health care, have to oppose uh, pri private health care and for uh, you know single payer for all and, and national health care. So that's what we're about and making a connection with the workers here and workers in other countries. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. And um, we could have a whole uh, day, I think, uh, webinar exploring some of those ideas about working with uh, labor and the unions and the intersection between the, um, you know, the exploitation of working people and um, our predatory healthcare systems and how they interface with each other. And that connection, I think, is so important for us to um, uh, to expand and and explore right now with working people, you know, being um, really at the cutting edge and uh, very much subject to abuses of all sorts at the workplace, including around healthcare, and um, you know, with with. Uh, a very big strike on the horizon with UPS and 350,000 workers who may potentially go on strike, uh, actions at Amazon and Starbucks and so on, um, and as well as with the nurses unions and with students, uh, uh, college students and um, uh, the teaching staff and so on. Uh, working with unions and organized labor now and assisting in that breakaway from Democratic Party stranglehold uh, is really, really important. And I'm just really glad that you're here connecting and I hope you know we can all continue to uh, further uh, develop these connections because it really is a big struggle and 
uh, divided we're conquered, but together we're unstoppable. So thank you so very much. And we're going to jump back now to Matsumela Odom from the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. Are you with us now? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, hey, who are everybody? Uh, my name is Dr. Matsumela Odom. I want to uh, thank everybody um, uh, for inviting me to this to this panel. I want to salute uh, you, uh, Dr. Jill Stein, and all uh, members of the Green Party um, for, for this um, a chance to address health care. You know, I'm the president of the International People's Democratic Horror Movement in PEDEM, which is a mass organization underneath the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party formed to defend the democratic rights of, um, formed to defend the democratic rights of the African community, bring African people back into political life. And one of those democratic rights, of course, uh, is um, uh, the right to health care. Uh, you know, in the Huru movement, we are guided by our what's called the Revolutionary National Democratic Program. And in it, we demand uh, immediate free health care for all Africans in the US to deal with really colonial based a plethora of illnesses and diseases that uh, afflict our people subsequent to slavery and colonialism and continued uh, the abrogation of our right to self-determination. Of course, there's not a single health category in which white people and African people in the United States uh, share uh, um, uh, a likeness and, and things like that. So we understand very clearly that this is not a medical question, uh, this is a political question. Uh, and therefore we need uh, political uh, solutions around it. Could we demand clinics and healthcare must be made available for our people, especially workers in rural agricultural communities. Uh, also, healthcare workers must receive payment for their work. All, uh, all efforts, we know that this chronic, chronic, chronic underpayment of African women in healthcare and overexploitation of African women and things like that um, in, in healthcare as well. So, one of the, uh, so I uh, just want to end by saying July 29, 2023 is the one year anniversary of the uh, FBI attack against our organization. On that day um, uh, in St. Louis, the Uhura movement was organizing uh, for the African uh, doula project uh, to organize mm -hmm. doulas in St. Louis because uh, enough black children die every year in St. Louis to fill up 15 uh, uh, classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, uh, so So we understand that 15 kindergarten classrooms. So we understand once again that this is a political question and, and, and which, which requires um, a political solution. So I wanted to say hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa. And uh, for more information on Impedum, go to impedum.org. And for more information on the Hands Off Uhuru campaign, you can go to handsoffuhuru.org. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Odom. Um, very powerful perspective. Um, thank you. We're going to turn now to um, uh, questions that I guess are submitted by um, members of the Zoom tonight, and these will be presented to us by Kami John, if I have that right, and that's a uh, name of his own choosing. So uh, Kami John of, Real, uh, of the Real Pro Progressives is going to read us a couple of questions. Why don't we start with the first one and then we'll be directing those questions um, to the speakers. And among the, the four speakers, if anyone particularly wants to respond to a given question, you know, just raise your hand and uh, let us know. All right. Thank you, Dr. Stein. And thanks sure. everybody for coming. All right. First off, we've got a directed question to Dr. Flowers. And Rita says, please explain what single payer would do to hospitals. You talked about federal assistance. Could you talk more about that to give me some answers when I'm asked about it? Sure. Yeah. And thank you for that question. So I talked about uh, what a national single payer system would do is it would create uh, global budgets for hospitals to operate. So this means no longer do hospital staff have to keep track of every Band-Aid and every you know, alcohol pad that they use. Uh, the hospital would get a global operating budget to purchase the supplies that it needs to, you know, to pay its staff. And then the staff would just focus on, on taking care of their patients in their community. So um, the other part of that is uh, having 
separate capital budgets for hospitals. Because what we have right now is, you know, particularly in an urban area, one hospital will get a certain type of technology, start marketing that technology, come, you know, for our new scanner, our new surgical procedure, whatever. Uh, and then the hospital on the other part of town is like, oh, look what they're making off of that. We need to get this too. And then there's this like battle. This doesn't make any sense. It's a huge waste of resources. We know that uh, that health professionals have a you know greater expertise and better health outcomes when you know they're doing a, a good number of procedures. And if you start having each hospital doing this, um, it, it dilutes that. And so moving more towards centers of excellence for the various hospitals where they each have kind of their niche in the healthcare uh, ecosystem and and you know can be good at that. But that would basically uh, prevent our hospitals from being shut down and allow them to really focus much more on the on the care of patients. Wonderful. Very well said, Margaret. Thank you so much. Um, so Kami, John, do you want to give us uh, a second question? Yep. And then we can move on to the next uh, okay. sponsors. Okay, All right. Great. This question, this question is from Nassim and it's uh, directed at Don Fitz. And it says, Mr. Fitz, how have Cuban medical institutions kept up with technological developments, including making their own vaccines, despite the crushing sanctions and embargoes imposed by the U.S.? Okay, the answer is simple. The answer is with great difficulty. Um, Cuba has developed a huge number of um, vaccines, has developed a huge number of medical techniques, but over and over again, the problem comes up that, that they find it very difficult to do this because they're, they're lacking the ability. Uh, during the Angolan War, one of the physicians I, I talked to who, who went to Angola described how he wanted to come back. And uh, he was a kidney specialist, a, a pediatric kidney specialist, and he wanted to build a hospital for children with kidney disease. But he couldn't do it because he could not get the equipment to do that. So the, the, the embargo directly interferes with what goes on you, you know, with the attempts of Cuba to improve medicine. But it's not just improving medicine, it's improving, uh, it's changing the way people think. Okay, if, if I could see everybody who's, you know, we have four people now. Um, uh, Kami John, are you able to put the people on who are in, in the smaller plant? Because I want to ask everybody a question. Okay, and the question is, uh, everybody who can be seen on the screen, put, put your face on. Okay, has your physician visited you in your home during the last year? Raise your hand like this if that has happened to you. Okay, nobody raises their hand. If your physician has not visited you in home during the last year, you know, put an X up like this. Uh, sh show us, you know, if you're uh, <laughs> okay. Now, if I went to, I always like to ask that to students when I teach about Cuba. But if you went to Cuba, you would find the reverse. Virtually 100% of the people in the population have been visited by their physician in the last year because they're required to by law. And, and if somebody has particular health problems or at risk for any problem, they'll be visited by the physician two, three, or four times in their home, depending on how severe the problem is. This did not happen the day after the revolution. This, this happened, it took 25 years to develop the idea that this needed to be done. And so what I'm pointing out is that, again, Medicare for all is the beginning. It's not the end point. Once we get, begin the understanding that people can have the power to change the medical system, we will develop thoughts and ideas and practices that we don't even imagine, you know, the day that we get Medicare for all. Great, thank you. Thank you, Don. And uh, thank you, Kami John, for the questions. We're going to uh, jump into our second panel right now, and we're going to start with John Douglas from the Green Party of Santa Barbara County. Are you there, John? I sure am, Dr. Stein. Thank you oh, very great. much. Thank, uh, you. thank you for your service to the country and uh, to all of us. And uh, I wanted to thank also Steve Zeltzer for bringing up the, uh, uh, the AFL-CIO. I've been a member of the Musicians Union for most of my life and um, on the Faculty Association at Santa Barbara City College. So I've been a union man for for uh, going on 50 years and uh, 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 I've been trying to convince my local and our faculty association to get on board with single payer health care. It's, it's an uphill climb, but uh, it, 
you know, we just got to keep doing it. A uh, lot of debate in the chat about state by state versus uh, uh, putting our resources into the federal national payer bill. But I've got to hand it to Ryan Skolnick. Uh, I know Ryan from from working on CalCare with the the nurses, and uh, you know we we feel that our our movement is uh, works equally well or should work at the same time with our support for the Jaya Paul and B Bernie Sanders bills in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless of whether we pass a single payer bill in the state or federal level, one thing that has to be addressed before we move on is um, the corporatization of medical groups and hospitals that are getting swallowed up by huge um, uh, uh, Wall Street entities, uh, and this is goes hand in hand with with Medicare Advantage and ACO Reach. Those programs are going to make it single payer even more difficult. We need to address this corporatization and and the monopoly power of these huge medical groups and and hospital uh, corporations. Uh, I've been working on single payer health care since 1994 when Proposition 186 was on the ballot here in California, and uh, we're not giving up. We're going to keep on fighting. Uh, so let's rock on with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. And yeah, we need a little music to... Um you know, to power up on this, uh, on this battle. So I've, I've been playing Cuban music since uh -huh. 1975. I love the, <laughs> the people of Cuba and their music. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Yes. A lot of synergy there. Um, and now we're going to move to Ed uh, Grister from National Single Payer. Take it away, Ed. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Uh, I guess I, I, I would like to start by saying that uh, listening to all the panelists and the unfortunate description of the, the massive crises that exist in the United States, the real question comes up, why, why don't we have a movement that is strong and vibrant and pushing and radical and, and making, making the changes that are necessary? And that's one of the reasons that the activists in National Single Payer around 2020 began discussing this. We all have decades of experience in pushing for Medicare for all, whether it's in California, over into the eastern uh, states of the United States. So people got together and they said, how could it be that you have a strong current of support for Medicare for all? The consciousness of people, the need is so great, yet in Congress, you can barely get anybody to talk about it. And, and then so we, we, we discussed this and we said, we need to get a poll, a national poll of an organization that will begin to collectively pull together the strength that people have and educate them, talk to them, organize them, use it. Like, for instance, in the unions, how could it be? And I was in the labor, I was the president of the Central Labor Council for 15 years. How could it be that you had 600 labor unions endorse Medicare for all? And today, the AFL CIO is literally selling. Medicare Advantage plans. And the reason our belief is, is that we don't have a firm and strong ideological basis that the for-profit system has to go. That is the linchpin of our system. And it delivers inferior care. And it also corrupts most of the individuals in Congress. The example is in 2006, we had Representative Conyers come to Pittsburgh. He signed on to the single payer bill and he was accompanied by the local congressman, Mike Doyle, who has since retired. This is 2006. The next day in a local paper, Congressman Doyle said, yes, I signed on to the single payer bill, but guess what? The only reason I signed on to that was because I knew it would never pass. And why won't it pass? Because the people in Congress are corrupted and we, we necessarily have to build a stronger grassroots movement. And what does that mean? It means kind of like shifting away from the from the inside game where you curry favor with congressional people. We should be doing as many of the speakers talked about here, currying favor with the people on the street. There's millions of people who don't have health care. Biden and Congress just cut 15 million people from Medicaid. And there hasn't been a peep from the unions officials. There hasn't been a peep from the Democrats. There hasn't been a peep from from almost anybody. 
the, yet we have a, a source of power that we believe we could organize. So the optimism is we have the strength of the people behind us. We have to figure out a way to coalesce that support into a nonpartisan, like Dr. Flower says, we need a nonpartisan, we need an independent movement that isn't tied to any political party that functions in, in, with coalitions with other groups because we can't win healthcare justice just by focusing on healthcare. You know, okay. poverty is the this third leading cause of death in the United States. So with that, I want to thank you, nationalsinglepayer.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ed. Very well said. We could easily make a, um, a full day conference out of just all the wisdom that's being shared here. All of this really deserves to be uh, explored and um, expanded and a basis for unity. So thank you very much for your part. So we're gonna move next to Eric Kessner, who's gonna talk to us about yellow vest actions and we can tell who he is here by, by what he's wearing. Go ahead, Ed, thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Kessner. Uh, I'm with, uh, I'm an activist with Yellow Vest Actions, uh, formerly Bernie or Vest. Uh, and now uh, we're a part of the Real Progressives umbrella. Um, but uh, Dr. Flowers, I really loved what you had to say. Um, I agree 100% with everything that you said. I think that it, we owe it to ourselves as, um, as, as activists to uh, become more informed about the funding mechanisms uh, involved in, in paying for Medicare for all, and for that matter, uh, all the other large uh, expenditures that need to happen, like a Green New Deal and student debt cancellation and these types of things. These large expenditures, uh, they can't be paid for it at the state level unless, uh, unless there, people are taxed, unless residents are taxed. So that's what the state-based programs are about is is they, they call it Medicare for all, they call it single payer, they call it universal health care, but it's really none of those things. It's taxpayer paid, state taxpayer paid, enhanced health care. And I think that's how it should be presented and not attached to um, you know, the Medicare for all or, or, or you know, the federal pay terms. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, only, uh, only the federal government has the ability to take care of such large expenditures um, and, uh, and to call a state program uh, one of those terms is just wrong because uh, the, 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 the taxpayers are paying, for, we want free health care. That was the whole idea in the first place behind Medicare for all. We want free health care like all the other modern countries have. And, uh, you know, paying through the nose at the state level that defeats the purpose of, of having, you know, Medicare for all, which is what we've been desperate for for so long. The left is, you know, it's, you know, since Occupy and the whole Bernie thing, the left is, is kind of splintered. And, and we've even splintered uh, in, in, in just the, the basic economics of the whole thing. Uh, you know, some people can see the basic economics. The, the, you know, you can look at the CAFR report and you can see that there's only a few weeks of, 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 of uh, you know, uh, of emergency money, you know, and, and there's no uh, state at all that can fund 100% of its own pensions. So how are we going to pay for uh, a giant expenditure like Medicare for all at the state Eric, level? It's not going to happen. We have to, your we have time to really, is up. thank you. We just have to quit kidding ourselves and, and like Dr. Flowers said, we have to tell the truth. So that's all I have, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we're moving on to Zach Schimmel from the March for Medicare for All. Take it away, Zach. Thank you. My name is Zach Schimmel. Uh, last month I graduated from high school and this fall I'm starting at the University of Michigan. I'm also a national steering committee member with March for Medicare for All. On July 24th, 2021, this movement launched with 56 actions in cities across the country in solidarity for national improved Medicare for all. Now, just two years later, we've seen it shatter into dozens of state-based initiatives, which not only serve to delay a national single payer program, but also come directly from the lobbyist filled hallways of the DNC. 
Nancy Pelosi and her henchmen have directed us to stop pressuring Congress and take the fight to the states. Mm. People seem to believe that fighting at the state level is a more attainable goal. But what they don't realize is that insurance companies don't become less greedy within a state border. And we are only made weaker if we allow ourselves to be divided. To win true healthcare justice, we need a unified working class movement. We invite the state movements to come back and join us in a united front to finally secure a national healthcare system, which works for the people and not for private profit. In just two and a half weeks, March for Medicare for All is having another National Day of Action, featuring an event in East Palestine, Ohio. We've spoken with the people of East Palestine, and we know, and they've made it abundantly clear how important Medicare for All is to them. After yet another corporate-produced environmental disaster, the people were again abandoned. Our federal government, who is the only body capable of providing a single-payer health care system, has left them to the whims of the private sector. So on Saturday, July 22nd, let's come together to declare once and for all that health care is a human right. The people demand single payer and nothing less. Thank you. Um, and Zach, can you tell us where, uh, what's a URL where people can find out more or, or Facebook or Twitter? Yes, it should be uh, m4mforall.org. Okay. I think uh, people can put it in the chat too. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Powerful. Powerful thoughts there. And then we're going to move now to Karen Caligiri, if I have that right, from Real Progressives. Take it away, Karen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Caligiri, a volunteer with Real Progressives, um, a nonprofit that tries to teach how federal finance actually works. Um, and like Dr. Flowers, we advocate for a national versus a state by state approach to single payer. And here's why. There is a difference between a currency issuer and a currency user. The U.S. federal government issues our currency. It creates the U.S. dollar, and it doesn't even need our taxes to do it. <laughs> All the rest of us, though, uh, including states and cities and you and me, we all use the currency. And so that means if I need to pay for something, if I have to pay my rent, I have to get a job. And if a state needs to pay for a program, it's got to tax people, or if it's lucky, it may get some money from the federal government. Federal government doesn't have to worry about that. There is a very wonderful video clip you can look up where former Fed Chair Alan Greenspan actually admits in a testimony to con Congress, he admits to Paul Ryan that, quote, there is nothing to prevent the U.S. federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. Uh, he then goes on to explain like the real uh, restraints that a currency issuing government like ours faces. Um, not the fiscal restraints, the real restraints. And if you take that concept of restraints and you apply it to a healthcare setting, you can probably imagine what we need to focus on. What did we run out of during the pandemic? Uh, what real things didn't we have? PPE, ventilators, uh, hospital beds. And, you know, uh, like Cuba is so good at marshalling their resources. We ran out of these things. We ran out of people right? Trained and qualified hospital staff. Uh, if we want to be successful, we have to focus on building those resources. Those are the restraints that any healthcare system faces. And a state by itself cannot marshal those resources in a time of crisis. Um, it can't even face the excess demand that will occur the day that we have single payer because there will be additional demand, right? But a state can't handle it. Only the federal government with its ability to create dollars Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. And um, we're going to move now to uh, two more questions again from uh, Kami John. Do you want to uh, read yeah. them out, John? Yep. So, what we're going to do, and uh, we're going to point a couple questions. This first one's going to go to Ryan. And he answered it a little bit in the, the chat here, but uh, Cole asks, does CalCare take into account the hospitals needed, the staff needed, the training for the staff, and just transitions to new jobs for the displaced people in the insurance market? If you want to expand on that, Ryan, feel free. Yeah, sure. Great question. So Dr. Flowers mentioned how federal Medicare for All implements a new financing mechanism for institutional providers called Global Budgets. 
uh, CalCare does the same thing. And global budgets are a much more stable funding source that is more equitable than the privatized financing that we have now, particularly toward rural hospitals, a quarter of which are currently at risk of closure. But it goes beyond a more stable funding source. You have additional funding sources as well. Just like in the federal Medicare for All bill in the House, you also have special projects and capital expenditures budgets that are specifically designed to allow um, facilities, especially ones in the case of special projects that are under-resourced, to hire adequate staff, purchase equipment, essentially allow for the system to actually be used because guaranteeing people coverage through a single payer system doesn't do you any good if they can't actually see a doctor. Um, so yes, that is those me mechanisms are built in. As for a transition, just like federal, um, you have at least 1% of a multi-billion dollar budget for the first five years of the program dedicated specifically to helping people whose jobs are affected by the transition. We just like same logic as federal, uh, we want to leave the greed, so profit motive healthcare system that we have currently in the past. We don't want to leave workers behind though. So anyone whose jobs are impacted will be able to benefit from the transition fund, just like with federal Medicare for all. Thank you. And um, John, yeah. you want to give us one more. Yep. Uh, this one's for Dr. Cohen, and it's from Nassim. And he asks, Dr. Cohen, are there healthcare systems in any specific country that you believe should be used as a model for a U.S. universal healthcare system? If you wanted to expand on that a little. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I think in the end, we have to devise our own system that works best for us. But there, are, But there's some systems I really like. I really like um, I had heard about Can um Can I'm sorry, Cuba's system before the discussion tonight. And what I, I I heard about it, there's this thing called the belly of the beast. <laughs> and I watched and they had uh, some people talk about their experience. Americans who went to medical school in in Cuba talk about their experience and why they chose Cuba. And what I really liked about Cuba's system was it's it's in the community. It's very preventive based it's very holistically based and the doctors don't just sit in an office and the patient comes there they go out into the community and they interact with and with the people and they, they it's like they bring the doctor to your door and i really i really liked that that system um and that approach um because um one of the things that happens that i see is patients where i live they have so much difficulty getting to the doctor's office um and um and i also uh have had some experience i was so i have a couple friends who live in uh one in finland and one in sweden and i um i thought once again their systems uh their approach which is once again very preventive uh maybe not as down to earth as cuba's but very preventive would be a good model for for our country um Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cohn. And we're going to move ahead now because it's getting late and I want to be sure we get you out on time. Um, so we have another panel of four people and then two questions to follow that. And then we'll do wrap ups where each of our um, uh, initial speakers will kind of give us your final thoughts, just a minute or two worth from each. So uh, first, Michelle Mashburn from the Green Party of Santa Clara County. Thank you so much for being with us, Michelle. Hi, thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have had invisible and visible disabilities for almost 30 years. I am an ambulatory wheelchair user with other complex medical needs based on social determinants of health. Even with access through to care through Medicare and Medicaid, I struggle to find equitable and competent care that does not make me more disabled. We as disabled people have a difficult time accessing care with many doctors office refusing to accommodate us. A 2021 study of 714 physicians showed that more than 80% reported that people with disabilities were presumed to have a worse quality of life and 60% felt that they could not provide the same quality of care to disabled patients as they do to their non-disabled patients. In addition to the multiple layers of discrimination and bias in the existing healthcare systems, disabled people often must navigate complex services and other administrative 
hurdles like home and community-based services, DME equipment, and multiple providers. I want to share two situations I have experienced that reflect these findings. Um, in 2021, a hospital discharge planner deemed me incapable of caring for my mother based on my wheelchair use alone. In 2023, the company assigned to fix my broken wheelchair that I rely on for much of my life activity refused because the insurance reimbursement would be too difficult and likely too little. Disabled people experience program gaps first and are often tasked with addressing those systemic gaps with limited resources. We're a creative bunch. Um, ableism in the United States is institutional and structural. We must take steps to unlearn this bias and build better solutions for everybody. I support single, a, a single payer system and I caution everyone to look at who is represented in the strategic discussions and decisions for implementing such a system. Let's work to ensure that there is adequate representation, including disabled people who have experiences to talk to these gaps from their lived experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And it's just so important for everybody to think about the challenges of the disabled because eventually um, just about everybody is going to be disabled at some point in your life. And if we have systems that are built in, it will advantage everyone. Did you want to say something? Yes. I want to, I want to call you in on saying the disabled because that others and makes us an object. I would mm -hmm. prefer you re refer to us as human beings and people. Um, and that's an important gap that I was just talking about, you know, that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Wendy Ramage from the San Jose Peace and Justice Center. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you so much. In my early 20s, I was diagnosed with late stage Lyme disease, combating terrifying neurological symptoms as my functioning deteriorated. I struggled for my life, experiencing horrific chronic pain, including severe complex migraines and full body pain. Medicare helped me access vital treatments I knew others in my community with private health insurance didn't have access to. For example, I required many months of IV antibiotic treatment that my Medicare insurance provided. I knew many who were simply cut off at the 20 to 30 day mark. Late stage Lyme requires a variety of treatment modalities. And since my ongoing battle and long recovery with Lyme disease and co-infections, I learned I have an extremely rare genetic auto-inflammatory disease, FMS, familial Mediterranean periodic fever syndrome, likely triggered by the infectious stress of Lyme. I have learned in my 20 plus years as a Medicare recipient that these diagnostic categories represent many more of us than I ever thought before. Nearly all of the chron chronic complex medical conditions we may face in a lifetime are clinically diagnosed and treated. In short, it is not one particular group left more vulnerable than others. Everyone requires care and ongoing care in most cases. The single payer movement recognizes the need for this life-saving access to care regardless of diagnosis or level of income. I am an individual who continually struggles with debilitating at times acute pain and suffering, and I require care and services routinely. We cannot do without a system of care that responds first to the most vulnerable and those in need of dire care. We must acknowledge the care is ongoing and the need that much more vital. A system designed to meet human need above profit ensures a presentation and preservation of life, meaningful contribution and a means to build ongoing change in our very broken healthcare system. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing with us tonight. And Barbara uh, Dahlgren from the Green Party Liberty Caucus. Go ahead, Barbara, hi. Hi, and thank you all for having us. Uh... As co-sponsors, thank you all for being here and especially the Missouri and California Green Parties. These webinars are just such amazing resources. This is the second one that I've participated in. So I encourage everybody to keep coming back. Um, just a little bit about what Green Liberty is. Uh, we're very concerned about medical freedom and con confronting state crimes, including 
the ways that the medical system has treated us, especially over the last few years. Um, it isn't really enough for us that everybody would get um, the free option to go to what we have now as a medical system and add a fifth prescription onto the other four that are already being given to us for things like lifestyle uh, associated illnesses that we get from uh, toxic air and water and toxic food and things like that, that we need to change the entire thing. Um, we demand second opinions and real research and debate, especially about experimental products, real choices, including nutritional and holistic care, including home visits. Um, we want more education on caring for ourselves. Um, the, the liberty part of the, the Green Liberty Caucus is like left libertarianism so that we actually have the resources in our communities and we don't have to like go to somebody on high um, in order for us to be able to live decent lives. Um, this includes things like food sovereignty and avoiding things like lead in our water. Um, so that we have options before anybody even needs to set in to set foot into one of these monstrous hospital complexes to begin with. So I posed a question for the panel um, about how we navigate through this national maze of corruption um, in every regulatory agency, in our, res uh, in our research dollars, uh, that's pretty much visited everywhere upon us um, so that our centralized system doesn't become either you do this that we want you to do um, or you don't get to have any health care at all and you're, and you're cut off completely um, so that people can really weigh the options of, of what they need for their individual health and their bodies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Very important point of view. Uh, and last here, we have Keith Preston from Attack the System. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, I have a question for anybody that wants to answer this. I heard a uh, discussion earlier of uh, healthcare reform taking place at the state level. And I, I thought for some time that while it may not be a perfect solution, a state by state, uh, process of reform might be worth undertaking. And it sounds like at least um, some local, some states have had some success with that. Uh, we've seen that with other, you know, reform of that level uh, with other issues as well. But one thing I was thinking about was uh, what about the possibility of locally based reform? And I'm thinking in particular of uh, Libby, Montana. Libby, Montana is a small city of probably uh, only a few thousand people. And for various uh, unusual reasons, they were able to actually get Medicare for all for the entire city. Mm. Um, so that city now has uh, Medicare for all. And I'm wondering if that might actually be uh, another route uh, going by a lo locality by locality basis, particularly when you have uh, sparsely populated or uh, lightly populated areas that uh, where uh, access to health care is often problematic due to lack of services and transportation and any number of issues. Um, and now it may be that the Libby Montana example is one that is uh, due to a unique combination of circumstances that couldn't be replicated somewhere else. But I wonder if anyone else is familiar with that example and the degree to which it might be a model for reform in other areas. Um, I don't know if anyone has a really quick response to that. We don't have a lot of time on our agenda, but if anyone, if any of the speakers, uh, yeah, go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, so that came out of the Affordable Care Act, and that was because Max Baucus, who was the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, which drove that whole process, is from Montana, and mm -hmm. the folks in Libby had suffered asbestos exposure, and so it was his own private carve out the one who was actually ordered my arrest, uh, carve that out for his own state so he could get political points for that. We're fighting for national improved Medicare for everyone. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed if a community like East Palestine argued that they should be included in Medicare or 
you know, people, different populations. I mean, Medicare has been expanding. It covers, you know, kidney patients now, uh, whether they're seniors or not. But but we need, as activists, we need to be fighting for a system for everyone. And we're only going to get that when we unite and fight for it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to move on now. And uh, John is going to take a couple of questions from attendees. John, do you, do you, you already have these from the chat? Is that right? Yep. Yep. I'm just going to do a couple questions and throw them out to the panel and whoever feels like answering them, or maybe a couple can give a little piece on it. Um, so this one is from Alice and she asks, how are large hospital systems able to continue to skirt antitrust laws? Over my 30 years as a nurse, I've watched the big fish swallow the little fish and the percentage of administrators go up while bedside care is secondary to consultant fees. If a healthcare system has a monopoly, shouldn't the government break it up or take it over? Any uh, takers out there? I have a quick thought about why we are seeing this trend of consolidations. I think the easy answer is as to why nothing's being done is because capital is, capital isn't going to regulate itself, that we know that's a myth. But I do want to emphasize that the for, greedy for-profit healthcare system we have is what encourages these sorts of consolidations. It's like a self-reinforcing thing because you have the system that pits insurance like basically you have insurance companies that are trying to pay doctors as little as possible and you have doctors trying to make as much as possible you put these financial interests against each other you have economies of scale you're essentially all consolidated so you have a system where and just like i mentioned earlier how value-based payments are essentially a capitalistic attempt to to lower the cost of health care it's always going to result in more it's the same thing here you can't have a system that tries to rein itself in through money through money because it's always going to be the opposite what happens is like i said you have a system where you have you're encouraging consolidation so i think that at the end of the day and i'm saying this because as the advocate for state-based solutions here i know there's sort of a divide there but i do want to bring back that the ultimate goal is national everywhere guaranteed health care for all through single payer and the fact that we are seeing these consolidations and the lack of antitrust action against them as evidence is why that's ultimately where we need to go. Great. Thank you. Last question, John. All right. We have got a question from Walter and it says, how many states have to pass single payer before the federal government will pass it? Will all the states who pass single payer have the same system? Seems a good yeah, one for maybe just, Dr. Flowers yeah. to Dr. clarify. Flowers being that I can say something after, but go ahead. Sure, I'm happy to take that. Um, thanks, Walter. I mean, this is the point is that if we turn this over to the states, and this has been uh, demonstrated through other types of policies, um, there is going to be a difference between the states in terms of what, what their systems are like, who they cover, who can get care. You know, but overall, and this is my concern, uh, a state and, and, and there've been, and there's, there's good articles at the pnhp.org website on this. There have been efforts by states to create what they thought were going to be universal systems. And every time they failed because of the cost required them. I mean, first off, they never met the, the goals that they had for who they were going to cover. They always you know, said, we're going to be able to cover this many people. And that didn't happen. Uh, but then ultimately, because of budget constraints, they had to start either cutting people from the system or or cutting the benefits, you know, the services that they provided. So we, you know, for all the arguments that have been made, you know, we just don't see the state as a way to do this. Um, and there is no, you know, there is no guarantee that even if a number of states start to adopt these types of systems, that they're going to turn into a, a national system. The only way we get a national system is by fighting for a national system. And it's something that we, uh, with very few resources, uh, actually got a single payer bill to the floor of the Senate on December 16th of 2009. Uh, so I know that it can be done. Uh, if we work strategically to do that, it's just that uh, 
I didn't get to talk about the obstacles, but we have to be aware of, of what the obstacles are to our movements and not fall for them uh, and, and be able to use tactics that counter the obstacles. And I think Claire wants to make a comment as well. Yeah, I one concern I, I have that I ask some of the people who are focused on trying to get it, get state based is the thinking that it would get it. We're not we're not Canada. And, and if you look at the legacy of racism in the United States, you know, there were states that got rid of slavery, but that did not mean all the states got rid of slavery. There were states that clung. It had to be a national effort, in that case, a civil war. Right now with the ACA, and I'm not for the ACA, but the whole idea was we would get states to implement this expansive Medicaid system. There are still um, nine or 10, depending, one state, North Carolina recently said, okay, but they haven't implemented, who have refused to do it. And even though they don't give a damn that there's some states that have good statistics, they don't care because of the racist nature of their government, that's not going to make them do it. So my concern is, Cal let's say California is successful, or New York, or, or Oregon, Mississippi, Texas, Alabama, they're not going to do it no matter how wonderful your, your health care statistics are because of the endemic racism in, the, in those states. So the same for me is we, even, we have to make this a national effort because every time we've ever overcome these kind of boundaries, especially when it comes to racism, it's been a national fight. And that's, that's my concern that, that if we don't make this a national fight, we're going to actually exacerbate the disparities because the, the states with all the big black populations are all the states that are going to say, I don't give a damn about what you're doing, California. Um, this is the way we're doing it right here. Great. If I may, super quick, um, mm -hmm. because I so when I first spoke earlier, I said that one of the defining traits of single payer activists is no, almost nobody works harder because this is such a fundamental right. It's been my experience as someone who's done state and federal organizing that people who do state organizing are never too burnt out to fight for federal legislation as well. In fact, a lot of people who are currently fighting for federal legislation are doing so because they found it through CalCare or through the New York Health Act. Now, here's my vision. As far as the question, how many states does it require? It could require 50 and it could require zero because states passing it into law is not the point. If a state like California passes what I will call single payer, we know that ERISA and a bunch of other things make it on the back end, not necessarily so. But for the end user, it looks like single payer, which can be done. If you implement that in California, I don't think that necessarily means Texas is going to pass it. But I think that it means that a lot of activists in Texas that might currently have no hope will have hope when they see it actually done somewhere else. And that may turn them from a passive standby to an organizer. The point isn't to implement it, it's to build a movement that can win. I believe that state efforts, whatever you may think on the differences and how we finance it and if it's possible or not, I believe that state organizing is federal organizing because I've seen it. I'm one of them. I started organizing for SB 562 well before I did federal organizing, and I've done a lot of both. So I believe that they're not antithetical. They do complement each other, because if you're fighting for guaranteed health care for all in California, if you are told, hey, we're having a rally for Medicare for all here, or will you start a ledge visit with your Congress member about Medicare for all here, they're going to show up for it. I believe that. So that's when we talk about a united movement, I think you can have a state effort and a united movement wholeheartedly. Great. Um, go ahead, Margaret. If I could just make a, a quick comment, because, you know, we in Maryland, we made a conscious decision uh, not to pursue state. We felt like it was misleading the people to make them believe that you could do a single payer system at the state level and that we didn't want to. We just couldn't mislead people. I, the the state bills that I've looked at make assumptions that I believe are incorrect. They assume because you can't regulate employee-based insurance, that employers are going to make a decision that the state system looks better for them financially and go for it. We don't have, you know, IBM proved that in Vermont that they they were a huge obstacle to the to the efforts there. They make assumptions that if the state creates a Medicare Advantage plan, that if it gets a waiver to do that, uh, that seniors will drop their original Medicare and you know traditional Medicare and go to the state system. That's not accurate either. And then even the uh, the 
the estimates of the savings that a state system can make assume that that system is going to be a pure single payer system. And I don't think it's possible to do that at the state level. And the, the, the people that have done those studies, well, Gerald Friedman has not answered that question for me. Like if they don't achieve that goal of creating a pure single payer system, but they do what's outlined in the, in the legislation, will you actually see the savings? And I don't think that you would see those savings to be able to, to have that system. So we were convinced in Maryland that uh, that this was not the path to take, and and we've been pursuing putting pressure on our on our Congress members. And I think this is the only way that we're going to win nationals if we if we unite and fight for it. Over. Um, we're kind of having our I think our final go around right now, which is good. And you know these are all really compelling thoughts, and um, you know very uh, inspired, whatever side of this discussion you're coming from, you know, so I just really want to thank everybody. I don't want to pretend we're going to solve the issue here, but um, you're certainly giving all of us a lot to think about and um, sort of, you know, motivating people, I think, which is sort of the bottom line here that we really want to encourage everybody to step up and get your friends to step up and, and connect and fight and, you know, demand from your elected officials and, you know, organize folks and that we build a broad convergent movement because, you know, I really agree uh, with Ryan on that score, you know, that that if we're going to move forward here anywhere, it's really about about movement building and there's not just one way to do that. Um, so let's see, who have we not heard from here in this uh, last go around? Don, do you want to throw in some comments? Uh, yeah. I, I'm going to a different topic, which is what we can learn from Cuba. Right. Uh, one of the things that I think we can first thing is that few people know it, but there was almost a civil war in the in the medical uh, associations in Cuba from the 1940s all the way through the 1950s, with uh, with people demanding fundamental change in the uh, medical system and other people wanting to have basically preserve the privilege they have. And so we're seeing something like that now in the United States. And certainly this webinar is one of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of discussions that people are having all over the country, which I think is, is vaguely similar to what went on in Cuba in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, a second point is that, that I think that one of the things that Cuba found it very easy to do and that the U.S. could replicate is that shortly after the revolution, they nationalized all the drug companies. They feel, realized they were a parasite on the body politic and they just nationalized them. I would love to have, like to have Cor Cornell West come on and say, if you're elected president of the United States, would you nationalize all the drug companies? Mm -hmm. um, a third thing I wanna say is, and this is the most difficult thing about replicating Cuba in, uh, in the United States. To replicate a community system, you have to have communities. And what's happened in America over the last half a century to a century is communities have been destroyed. Communities have been destroyed by the automobile. Communities have been destroyed by air conditioning. Communities have been destroyed by TV and social media. People in the United States overwhelmingly live as atomized individuals separate and apart from their communities. And as rough as people want to, don't, don't want to accept this, but you cannot have community medicine without communities. And that's one of the reasons that the Cuban revolution is correct when they say you cannot deal with just one thing like medical care by itself. You have to deal with a whole range of social ills. And uh, I mean, this webinar aside, I think that a lot of the electronic stuff that we have in the United States is a bunch of crap and destroys social relationships. Um, the last thing I wanna say, is, is, which makes it very difficult to replicate a community-based uh, community uh, system in the United States, is that in Cuba, half, almost half the doctors, not, not ha half, but like some data said, but the recent research shows it was like, like about 44 to 46% of doctors left to Miami. Well, it, it, you know, there's a tremendous debate inside the United States and there's a whole lot of reactionary people inside the medical system and where are they going to go? We're not going to get rid tell them to leave Miami and go back to Cuba. That's not going to work. Are we going to send them to Antarctica? But the thing is, Cuba, it was a double-edged sword in the, in the revolution because a lot of people suffered a whole lot in the first few, actually infant mortality went up in Cuba in the first few years after the revolution when, when 40 to 45% of the doctors left. And it wasn't until after that that infant mortality started to go down. So people suffered from the physicians leaving. 
But had those physicians not left, they never would have built the system that they have now. Mm. So these are some of the complexities you know, of social transformation that we really need to think about very deeply if we want deep transformation, you know. Great. And any final comments? Um, Dr. Cohn, did you have an opportunity to give your wrap up thoughts here? Uh, boy. Uh, first of all, I've I've enjoyed this, although this is well past my bedtime. <laughs> so, so I started washing dishes. That's what I was doing because I. <laughs> but um, I think we need more discussions like this. I really appreciate that the Green Part Party of Missouri put this on. I think this is one of the many ways to help build the movement. And although I think the way to go is is fighting for national payer, one thing I do agree with Ryan is that we have to find ways to inspire and to excite people on the local level and around the country to fight. And um, so, so that that I that that I agree with. We have to figure out ways to pull people in because the only way we're going to get single payer is there's going to have to be a massive grassroots movement putting a whole lot of pressure on the sold out po politicians of ours to do, to make it happen. So that's, I'll leave it with that. Wonderful. And I think that's a great place for us to end here on a point of agreement and um, building forward from there. So really look forward to seeing everybody again at the next uh uh, at the next webinar here in, in the series. And again, big thank you to all of our speakers, to all of the co-sponsoring organizations, and to the Green Party of uh, California and Missouri. Thank you all so much. Good night. It's past a lot of our bedtimes here on the East Coast, at least. Uh, Lauren, uh, did you want to make any final comments here as, as the host? No, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good Take night. care.